Good evening. This is the Journal Club. I believe what the 15th meeting of the AMI Journal Club. It is the 6th of December 2021. My voice should sound buttery soft in this microphone. Marco Gordels is going to be presenting a paper from Science Translational Medicine from the Eidelberg Lab about gene therapy and Parkinson's disease. And I just noticed, Marco, did you see the copyright in the upper right-hand corner? No, I did not. It says, copyright 2018, the authors, some rights reserved. Exclusive licensee for AAAS, which is the, who, who publishes science. No claim to U.S. to original U.S. government works. I can't keep up with the new publishing rules where they're constantly saying, oh, now you got to publish all of your data so that other people can analyze it and blah, blah, blah. But those things you should be aware of. You should notice those things uh, as they come, up, come across. Yeah, you're good. All right. So my paper is Gene Therapy Reduces Parkinson's Disease Symptoms by Reorganizing Functional Brain Connectivity. For those that don't know, gene therapy is a genetic modification of cells to produce a treatment for a disease. And in this case, we're working on Parkinson's disease, which is a neurodegenerative disease that affects the substantia nigra, which is part of the basal ganglia structure in the midbrain. And in the basal ganglia, they have the caudate nucleus, the putamen, globulus pallidus, subthalamic nucleus, and substantia nigra, and the substantia nigra cells in the Parkinson's disease is what cannot produce the TH, which ultimately creates the dopamine in, uh, in the brain. So they slowly develop symptoms over years, such as tremors, slow movement, rigid limbs, and issues balancing, and slowly the brain like is like a brain death to an extent. And right now, there's a couple of treatments for Parkinson's disease, such as L-DOPA, which acts as this TH to act as dopamine. It goes from TH into dopamine. But over time, the connections between neurons in the brain die out. So then... Okay, hold on, Marco. Uh, did you switch to another slide? No, not yet. Oh, so, okay. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, I'm, oh. I'm just giving the background right now. Oh, okay. All right. I thought you were show maybe showing another slide and it didn't show up on our screen. Yeah, no. Nah. So then here, we're just talking about the gene therapy modification of cells to produce a treatment. So this is figure one. Can everybody see this? Yes. Okay. So AAV2 GAD related metabolic pattern. That's the new linkages between basal ganglia and the cortical premotor plus motor regions, which is the GADRP. And the brain image right there just shows like the new linkages that are forming. And then you go to B, it shows that those that received the AAV2 GAD, or the gene therapy in this case, had greater linkages in the brain after six months and then to 12 months. And then those that had the sham surgery, which is like the placebo effect surgery, they had a surgery, but nothing was done to them. They didn't receive any gene therapy. Nothing happened to them. And they, re they stayed at natural history for the time being just natural progression of yeah what you'd expect like over, yeah just over time yeah. that's good right like this i don't think yeah, I, yeah, I miss yeah, anything yeah. there well let's ask for questions oh wait how do i go back uh, right. oh on an ipad i have no idea uh anybody have any questions about this one you all get what this is showing you um do you want me to do a 3D brain fly through so you understand what part they're talking about? I think we could do it in the next slide after oh. Alex presents this figure two. Oh, putting Alex on the spot. Yeah. Is Alex a freshman? No, he's the senior. Nah, Alex is a senior. Oh. That's too bad. Wait. Alex, you see that? Yeah. Alex, it would have been great if you just, like, disappeared right when he you just left me. Yeah. <laughs> It's just left okay. out to dry. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the left side is the AAV2 GAD, which is the, those who received the treatment. The right side is those who did not receive the treatment. And then okay, the wait, 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 wait. So here, there's a bit of a problem with describing it as left and right. Because uh, both are like 
we're talking about the left brain and the right brain. Like right. The, yeah. two, two parts so, of the brain. So what you mean is A versus B, right? Yeah. Side A is those who received the treatment, the AAVT okay. or AAV2, GAD. Side B are, is those who didn't receive the treatment. And then the subsequent rows are the timeline. So the first row is the baseline at which others are compared. And six months after the treatment and then 12 months after the treatment. Um, the L and R on the images, the L represents the left hemisphere and the R represents the right hemisphere. And then within the images themselves, the spheres are representative of the nodule activity and the lines, the connectivity. So in column or in group A, you can see as time goes on that the spheres increase, uh, signaling a greater nodule activity. And the thickness of the lines increase as well, which show that the connectivity strengthens between the different areas of the brain and then on on the b side the spheres stay relatively the same size they have like small fluctuations but not as great as the other side and then the thickness of the lines don't change significantly throughout time Hi, Alex, can you talk about the caudate in the middle at 12 months in the left hemisphere and how that affects all the other connections? Okay, so that's uh, the caudate is, has the largest uh, sphere in the left hemisphere in group A, which is part of the basal ganglia, which Mark was talking about earlier. Um, and so I believe that's what causes all the other connections to grow as well and strengthen. Yeah. All right, next slide. So this is figure three. It basically just depicts what Alex just said because it's the degree centrality, which is the number of links that are significant to a node. And you see how the caudate slowly progresses while the others progress after the six months. And the caudate is like the most important target that strengthens the other connections. And that's in the A figure. And then in the B, it's just the sham surgery. It's just showing the normal baseline levels. And figure four. That's hard. You want to do this? Yeah, this one's... This one is uh, tough. Uh, so should I do the anatomy now? Yeah. All right. Uh, stop sharing your screen for a moment. All right. And once he does that, there we go. Uh, you guys should pin me. So <clears throat> here we go. This is your brain. This is your brain on cocaine. Don't go, don't do cocaine. All right. So this is uh, a 3d brain that we designed when I was at Vanderbilt and you can turn it around. This one is actually split in half. So uh, the sidedness of the brain really is not what you see, but their own side. So this is actually the left side of the brain and you can, uh, can you guys see my mouse? Yeah, you can. Okay. So this is the left side of the left hemisphere of the brain. And if we turn it around, you've got this weird looking thing here and here and here. So this is called the caudate. This is the putamen, kind of runs down around. This is the globus pallidus. Okay. And these three things are the central parts of the basal ganglia they're they are called themselves the striatum but they're part of the basal ganglia which which some people include as uh substantia nigra and what was the other one substantia nigra and the um nucleus accumbens right marco the globulus pallidus no i said that one already this one here that's the globus pall pallidus uh johan um, what's the, what's like, what does 
what do those three things control? Like the uh, putamate, putamen, is that what it's called? Putamen. putamen. Yeah, it's either yeah. putamen or putamen or putamen. I, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Um, so some of you who've taken neuro have seen me demonstrate this when we're talking about Parkinson's disease. And maybe I'm going to be, let me make some notes also on presentations. Uh, if we were doing this in person, Marco would totally be acting out what Parkinson's disease looks like because you need to know what, what the point is. Like, why are we, we're saying this thing it's the, uh, that is modeling what happens during Parkinson's disease. But let's say you grew up in a cave and don't know and never seen Parkinson's disease. You kind of need to know what that is. Is that fair? You guys all know what Parkinson's, R hit the raise hand button if you've never seen somebody with Parkinson's. Really? No, that's not true. How, Caitlin, how could you not, if your mother is in medicine, how could you have never seen somebody? Really? I don't think so. Okay, okay there's a bunch of you. I, I bet you have all seen somebody and you just want to see me act this out. And that's wait, wait, you, you like seen like, like personally or like personally personally yeah no no i've never seen anybody personally okay. Wait, doctor, i acted out what i acted out yeah please i'd, I'd rather you do it i think it's like um hold on i'm i'm looking for you hold on where'd you go i'm right here yeah, there you are go ahead so it was like they're hunched over a little bit yep. I I shake yeah yeah yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. So they're, the classical symptoms are that hunch that they have, which really has to do more with their their difficulty in keeping balance than it has to do with anything else. It's not like osteoporosis or anything like that. Um, and you saw his hands. Usually usually there's there's predominance of of one of them where as they're walking, it'll be really one. And this is actually the motion it makes. Okay. It looks like, um, if I took like a Tylenol, okay. And you take a Tylenol pill and you roll it around in your hands like this. It's actually called a pill rolling tremor, which some people do is like a nervous tick. Um, so a pill rolling tremor. And so it kind of looks like this and, and you're losing the ability to make, fine motor movements so you're in this hunch as i said it's it's it is more about your lack of coordination than it is about your like bones or anything and and what you can't see on the screen is that my toes are kind of pointed towards each other and i'm taking a step as if i'm unsure where the ground is okay take a step and then another step and it, and it ends up looking like let me see if i can you can see me no not in this tight uh can't, wait a minute La, la, la. So they'll kind of walk like this, knock need. Okay. And what that is, is they're having trouble with proprioception, the ability to sense where their, where their body is in space. So, so what's happening there is that if you remember right in the beginning, Marco talked about dopamine. Dopamine is made by a part of the brain called the black substance, the substantia nigra. Are you going to talk about that at all, Marco, or you want me to talk about that? About what, the substantia nigra? Yeah. Didn't I already discuss how the TH gets created into dopamine. Yeah, but you didn't show a picture of it. Visualization is everything. Why don't you look for that right now? I'm going to show where it is, okay? So if we look at the brain, and I twist it around a bit, okay? Right, so you see right here is the pineal gland. Here are the superior colliculi, and inferior colliculi is, uh, is Campbell here? Is she still sick? No. Um, anybody who took neuro last year? Nobody. Um, Megan Alvarez and Nolan. Nolan did. Well, I wanted to. Okay. 
Um, Nolan, did you raise your hand because you took neuro? I did take neuro. Yeah, you did. Right. Do you remember what I call those things? No. <clears throat> the saber, the saber tooth tiger nuclear. Oh yes, yes, because of fight or flight. Right. Right underneath them. Right underneath them, in the midbrain, there are these two, um, this little line of dopaminergic cells that tend to die. They're very sensitive to environmental insult. So they tend to die early on um, before the rest of your body does. And without them making dopamine, they can't, they, they're the things that refine your movement. So I started this originally by trying to answer or getting into the answer for Johan's question. What do these things do? So what these do are they refine movement from the brain. So up in your motor cortex, if I swing this around real let me uh, zoom out a bit. Swing it around. Oops. Right here, this strip right here is called the primary motor cortex. That is the thing that sends the signal to, to your spinal cord, which then sends a signal to your muscles to make a movement. You know, and, and they, this is not a graceful thing. Okay. So those of you who've seen me pretend to do this, it, it, you know, if I said there's nothing in here, that's not breakable. So I can't really do this. If, if, if I, if, if it was like touch the board, it'd be like, boom, and it'd be a gross movement. Okay. Not a refined movement. That's what the, that's what the motor cortex does. However, that motor cortex sends part of its signal to these guys in here, the striatum, the basal ganglia, to actually refine the movement and slow it down and make it more precise. So if it's like, okay, touch the camera, instead of going bam and smashing the camera, I can actually go, oh, there's the camera, right? And I can be very precise. In people with Parkinson's, their ability to do intentional, precise movement is, is eliminated, okay? However, the first line of the first line of uh, therapy that they have is what Marco mentioned really quickly, which was uh, levodopa or L-dopa. Do you have a picture, Marco, of the pathway? Um, I have a picture of the tyrosine hydroxylase being converted to dopamine. If you want to see that, tyrosine hydroxylase is the enzyme that converts into dopamine. tyrosine into L-dopa. Right. Yeah. So yeah, go ahead and share your screen. Do that. I believe that's what it is. Cause... Right. Okay. Right. So see where it says tyrosine up at the top of um, his screen. And then there's an arrow that says TH. The TH is the, is the enzyme that converts the amino acid tyrosine into DOPA, which is the precursor to dopamine. That is what we call in, in almost, I think not just almost, in every chemical pathway there is, biochemical pathway in any in the field. That is what we call the rate limiting enzyme, the thing that takes the longest to work. It's the slowest thing. So it actually limits the rate at which you make dopamine. So the, tr the primary treatment for newly diagnosed Parkinson's is to actually give the, those patients a ton of dopa. It's called levodopa or L-dopa which is then converted into dopamine. And for about two or three years, they're fine. That actually works really well. But then their body, the cells in their substantia nigra, their black substance continue to die anyway, because they were, they were already dying. There's other stuff going on. And so as they continue to die, they're no longer converting that extra dopa into dopamine. And you start to get the symptoms again. When you, and when you have that, you lose connectivity between the striatum, between the parts of the striatum that are being covered in the figure. You lose the connections. Okay. All right. So let's go back to, go back to figure two. Well, I have to 
keep logging back out to get into the. Should I just share my screen again? Mm hmm. Good. All right. So in figure two, you have you have pretend drawings of each of these anatomical places. There's a caudate. There's a putamen. There is a, I'm going to pull it up myself so I can see it. Caudate, putamen. There's a frontal lobe. I mean, the frontal lobes are making the decisions. Uh, the thalamus is just the railway station through which those the signals are sent. And um, the globus pallidus or pallidum. Uh and what you're seeing in this, as they, as uh, as Alex had pointed out, was that the circles seem to be getting bigger when you're treating it with this virus. Did any of you notice that it was a virus? AAV two. Does that look familiar at all? There's a deafening silence because Sean Haggerty had baseball practice. But in his journal club two weeks ago, they used the same virus as a vector. The same one. It's a denovirus, right? So um, there, there's, there is a continual, yeah, there's a string of continual ideas in these journal clubs that are going, you know, one to the other where you're actually reusing themes here. So I'm hoping that you're noticing that and appreciating it so that, you know, somebody, I don't know, you're, you're, you're at some trivia thing and people are like, this is used as a vector to get things into the brain. And you're going to be like, I know that one AV. We had it like 15 times in journal club. Yeah. But you know, and it's, then it's useful. Then it matters. Uh, but AV was, was, covered in uh, Sean's work with CRISPR. And what you're seeing is that those, those circles are getting bigger because they seem to be having mathematically a bigger effect. Okay. Those are, we're just calling them nodes. So, so you, this all has to do with figure four. Okay. Nodes are like, you can imagine, uh, here's the analogy. Nodes are like people, you know, the saying that there are only six degrees of separation between you and everyone else in the world. You ever hear that before? Yes. You know, I mean, you're shaking your head. Some of you are nodding. So, and some people joke that it's the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. Um, so, so the saying goes that it's such a small world. Now you are connected to every single human on the planet by, by only by no more than six people. Okay. So like, it's like, okay, you want to, um, how close are you to Barack Obama? Okay. How close are you to someone knowing personally knowing Barack Obama? Right. Well, you know me and I have a brother-in-law who works for ABC news in the white house who knows Obama. So right there, that's only three degrees of separation. Do you see? And you are connected to everyone on the planet. They think, by by less than six degrees the bigger star you are the bigger social media star you are um the the where's jess brown is she here now that she's insta famous on all the tick tickety talk um if if you are famous and you have all of those connections see facebook's a better example of this if you have you know fifteen thousand friends which do you actually have fifteen thousand friends no but you're better connected than someone who has 200 friends. So that person who has lots and lots of friends, lots of connections is a better node. You actually see this in a way more useful form on a, on a site like LinkedIn. So through LinkedIn, I have connections to a whole bunch of people, which you will eventually ask me to make connections for you. That's kind of the whole point of college is to network. And when you're talking about that, you're making, it's the same thing as what we're looking at in this paper. Parts of the brain are connected to other parts of the brain. And the question is, how many steps does it take for one part to talk to the other? If there's lots and lots of connections, then, then you can get there fairly fast. Vanya. Uh, I might be going back a bit, but you know, the, uh, the um, figure two where it has like the red line, um, on mm -hmm. like the A part. 
Mm-hmm. Is that like making another plane in it? No. It So the color. Oh, Marco, could you even see that? Yeah. Like the color. Oh. Yeah. Does that like make like a new it's, it dimension means something. or something? No, it, it means something different. So oh. um, the, a, a lot of their other figures are actually color neutral. So the color blind people can see them. But that one. Now that you pointed out, there's green lines and red lines. It's not very good. So green or blue means, so if they're thick, it means they seem to be connected to each other. And we know that because their their activity seems to be correlated. Correlation is not causation. It just means they might be related to each other. And you can feel more confident about that the, the more often it happens. Like if the caudate increases its activity and all of a sudden the globus pallidus increases its activity every single time you do it you know there's a strong connection there and that would be it be a blue line but if when the caudate increases its activity and the uh and the putamen decreases its activity every single time that'd be a red line so if, if i actually zoom in and look so it looks like yeah because it just looks like if you like compare the um the right hemisphere from six months and 12 months, yep. it looks like it creates a new plane. Yeah. It's, it, the it's, shape. Yeah. I see. So, so yeah. don't read into the three dimensional shape. Yeah, That's yeah. not what it's trying to show. Now it's just trying to show whether they're correlated. Okay. But, but you raise a good point about the difference between left and right hemispheres, because did anyone notice that there seems to be a difference? And can you, can anyone say why? Is it fair to say the networks of any type seem to be seem to be more numerous in the left hemisphere than the right? Is that fair to say? Yeah. Anybody want to conjecture on why that might be the case? Is this substantia nigra in the left hemisphere? Substantia nigra is in both. It's actually right in the midbrain, which is called the midbrain because it's in the middle, right in the middle of your brain. So you wouldn't actually really see it that well. Why might the left hemisphere? Johan. The left hemisphere or the left side of the figure? Or left like, hemisphere. Left well, I, you no, you can you can actually see a difference. Like, just look at B. Look at look at um, the right two columns, which are which are part, figure B, the sham surgery. Compare the left bra- brain networks to the right brain networks, and you'll notice that the left brain networks, the ones on the in the left hemisphere, are way more numerous and stronger than the ones in the right, even without the surgery. Why might that be the case? This was not brought up in the paper at all, um, but I just happened to notice it. Who was talking? Go ahead. Is the right responsible for spatial awareness? So it's more affected by Parkinson's? Oh, the latter part of that is right, right on the money, but not, not for the reason you said. Uh, Mark, did you read the methods? And if so, did you did they ask the question of what their dominant hand is? I read the methods, but I didn't pick that up. I didn't either. I didn't pick up on that either. I don't, and and that's n- normally a question you do ask when you do these things. What what's your dominant hand? It what's the most common answer to that? Right. Right hand. Right hand needs the precision which means stronger more interconnected left hemisphere so that that is so so alex you so that means that the the last part of what you said was true right that is that is actually affected by parkinson's disease it's hard to write when you're when you're you've got this tremor 
the uh, the uh, the proper medical term for this tremor is actually called a chorea, a C H O R E A, a chorea. Um, it's much more pronounced in uh, um, Huntington's, but but any type of tremor like that is called a chorea. It's a it's a uh, movement disorder, a dyskinesia. Um, so we can, I think we'll come back to that later. Now, now go back to figure four, because that, that was how I got off track in the first place. But I think that was important, especially establishing the analogy of the social media thing. Okay. So I, we're going to skip B because, um, because Mark and I couldn't really figure out what the point of B was. I, oh, oh, it was. I think it was just like a statistical thing. It, this doesn't really matter that much. What matters here and is kind of cool is that they were doing measurements of just how interconnected the systems were, the different parts of the brain were at different times. So each line is a different color. Let's just look at A, right? Um, people in who have ever had me for AP biology or, or you honors kids will, will eventually learn this. I'll yell at you about this, but there was something that really made me angry when I looked at this figure. Anybody want to take a guess what it was, what they did wrong that I can't stand. The different measurements on the side. Else. Well, so, so who said the different measurements on the side? Who was that? Uh, Nick. Nick. Berton. Berton. I don't even see you. Oh, there you are. Um, yeah, they're not labeled, so that's that's annoying. That was Marco noticed that also. Uh, somebody else yelled something out. I said different scales. Yeah, so the scales are okay as long as the things being compared are scaled the same, that which they are, right? A, all the things in A are scaled the same. All the things in B are scaled the same. That's not the problem. I thought you said something. I thought you actually... The axis that. doesn't start at zero for the Y. That's a problem. Actually, I hadn't noticed that. Good catch. No, that that's. Uh, hey, uh, everyone who's who's going to have me teach you lab stuff, if you ever, ever start an axis that's a measurement, not at zero, I will beat you senseless. That is misleading and inappropriate. Okay, so I don't I don't like that. That's true. No, there's something that really really chaps me that I yell at you people about all the time. It shows a statistical or a significant difference, right? That's fine. It, they they actually yeah. do the stats really well. Um, they surprisingly well. There are no, there are no titles on a figure. There are no titles on a figure. See right where it says mean degree of cer uh, centrality, and then the next one says normalized cluster co clustering coefficient. The, the point of the figure legend down below is to make sure that you say that. Don't put it above. This isn't middle school. Don't do that. Okay. A. Okay. Each line that you're seeing is, uh, forget about the thresholds. They're, those are the threshold. I, I, in my expertise, my limited statistical expertise, it looked like they did the stats well. well so just trust me. Don't worry about the threshold thing. Okay, ignore that. Just look at where the lines are. What you're seeing in A is that the, the lines of different colors uh, are all clustered down at the bottom except for the, the bluish purple line, right? And that bluish purple line is the 12 month after treatment. So you're looking at the light blue is, is right when treatment begins, which should be the same as a sham. A sham is like a, a placebo. And then the six months is a... What color is that? Kind of like a grayish green. And then uh, a bluish purple for 12 months and then a kind of a goldish grayish mustard color for the for the control. They're all bundled together except for that purple line, 12 months. And they put the asterisk next to it to say this line is significantly different. And if you th and so what is it actually a measure of is kind of cool. Mean mean degree of centrality translates in to, into normal speak as most popular which no, you know which 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 brains have the have the nodes that have the most popular most popularity right so so if you say okay i've got i've got a group of friends and each friend has 
has six other friends. And you're like, wow, that's that's great. But if 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 I have a group of friends who all have a thousand friends, I think my people are more popular than yours, right? Do you understand? So when you talk about centrality, it means like how important are the people in your group? And what it's saying is that bluish purple line is saying that after 12 months, the parts of the brain we've already looked at, the quadrate, the putamen, all those things are way more connected to each other than, than they were at six months or zero months or in the control. All right. And so obviously then if you want to get from one place to another, you have the ability in a more popular group, you have the ability to draw longer lines, right? If, if each person, if each person only knows like two people, I would go, okay, I know you, you know that person, and that person knows another person. That's it, right? It's a really, very short line. But if I have a thousand friends, I could draw a, you know, a thousand little node lines, and the line becomes really long, which is why after 12 months of therapy, they tend to be much longer. Okay, so that's just showing how, how what, it mat what matters. We stared at... I think Marco and I Googled like every single one of these terms because we I'd never used them. Small worldness. I was like, oh, come on, that's stupid. When we looked it up, it actually was probably the best way to describe this. How small is the world? You know, it used to be. Let's make this real for you. If you study virology or um, epidemiology, how diseases spread in the world. What you'll learn is that historically you will see plagues happen in cycles of decades. So a plague will come through, you know, where the mostly Europe, cause they were interconnected. It'll, it'll be a wave through Europe and then, you know, lots of people will die and things will calm down about a decade later, people start get, getting sick again. And another wave will come through usually of some like, like mutated strand. Sometimes usually the second wave is worse than the first wave, you know, then maybe a decade later, a third strand, but way more subdued, not as many people die and eventually kind of goes away. But that's because people, people only knew several dozen other humans ever in their life. Now we hop on a plane and go to Hong Kong at, on a whim like no big deal, right? And here have have my, you know, covid. Oh, thank you. Right? It is so easy to spread now that we are seeing those decade long des decades long waves happening in 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 a matter of months, right? Here we are what a year and a half to about 2 years into the into the start of this. And we've already we're already on omicron. Right? We had we had the original, we had the, the delta variant, we're on omicron now. And what are we seeing in omicron so far? The data would suggest it, it's actually a little weaker than the de the delta was scary. Omicron, highly infectious, but like a good virus, a good virus doesn't kill its host. It's very infectious, but it doesn't kill its host. It's not that you know deadly. And you're actually starting to see that. So we cycle through really, really quickly only because the nodes are, the world is so small, right? Those nodes are highly interconnected. So the more interconnected the nodes are, the smaller the world feels. And that's what they called this thing, D, small worldness. So, so what they were finding was that the 12 month treated group seemed to have much more interconnectivity between those areas than the other, than the six month group, the zero group or the, or the sham. And because of that, though the, the, well, because they were highly interconnected, it was, it was like a small world. They can actually communicate better. It, it's actually a pretty cool analogy that they, that they made in the terminology. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you guys, are you bored out of your mind or you think this is kind of cool? Like, what if you're studying? I don't know. You you want to study? Uh, uh, oh, you know what? I'll. Uh, it's science. I'm gonna I'm gonna go here. When AIDS first started, okay, and we were just getting the hang of how HIV is spread. At Catholic schools, 
in your senior year, you would have to take um, a really teeth grinding, horrible, awkward seminar on um, sexy time between seniors. Okay. Or between people in high school to talk about how HIV spreads. <laughs> and so if really uncool kid has a blood transfusion, right? Gets HIV from the blood. This doesn't happen anymore, but, but they, they, it did back in the eighties and early nineties blood transfusion now has HIV gonna die. Is that kid going to spread it? Probably no. not. Probably not. Right. Because cool kid, uh, uncool kids are not sexy. Therefore no sexy time for them. So, but, but if it's somebody popular, and then they, so in, again, this is Catholic schools. I forget what they called it. Senior. It, it had a really awkward Catholic school name for the course. What is, what's the senior uh, religion theology course called here at Morse Catholic? It's like touch safety or something. Say, are you blacked out? Say it again. Like touching safety. Touching what? Touching safety. She, he keeps blacking out, and I'm, I'm thinking he's saying touching Satan, and I know that can't be touching it, Touching right? safety. Yeah. Touching safety? You're, you're, you are making that up. That is not the name of the course. What is the name of the theology? You guys are screwing with me. And it's that's just well theology done. four. It doesn't have like a type, because like usually... Isn't it world have, like, religion or something? Our book says yeah. vocation, answering God's call. I think the course itself is Theology 4. In Schoology, it's Theology 4. I happen to That's know the, the person who wrote the Theology. It's just called Theology 4. That's a shame. Because we, we, we actually named ours because we cared about, you know, getting you guys as awkwardly, feeling as awkward as possible. Here it is. Theology 4. A life of love and service, world religions. Samita is correct. Extra points for her. That's what it's called. So, so theology one is called Jesus Christ and Revelation. Theology two is the mission of Jesus Christ. Theology three is life in Christ. And theology four, theology four is a life of love and service, also called world religion. So ours was way more awkward. Uh, and it, this was taught like it, it, like all the diocesan schools, but it, it would show then a, a tree of so-and-so hooked up with so-and-so on Saturday night. And then so-and-so actually cheated on their girlfriend with so-and-so. And that person had already been with, and it just created this horrible, have you seen any of these trees? Have you been forced to like live with any of this like crap? No. The people who are popular the the larger nodes in that network right were were the people who did the most damage for example who brought covid into morris catholic high school who's who is patient zero samita of course she is everybody knows that and she is she is right so she was the most important node she got everybody else sick that's how it works Never miss an opportunity to take a shot at a student. Okay. So you always anyway. attack me. Well, I almost died. And it's your fault. Okay, so uh, go ahead and I you know, I hopefully that makes sense and was interesting enough. So you want to wrap it up? Yeah. Can you still hear me? Yeah. All right. So yeah, I'm gonna get Johan to do this. Uh so, I've been studying this figure for the past 30 minutes or so. Um, so, from my understanding, um, I'm seeing that the uh, different types of treatment um, show the changes in uh, different types of expression, like GADRP expression and uh, PDRP expression. So, like uh, sham treatment, uh, sham surgery, and uh, the uh, GAD therapy. Um, both show different types of network expression within the brain. So, yeah. And the figure is saying that the GAD therapy improves the clin clinical symptoms without suppressing the uh, PDRP uh, expression. 
So that's basically what it's saying. What is what is STNDBS? I have no idea what that is. <laughs> Actually, I have no Me idea. Me neither. I, I, I don't know what but Marco, what's STN? Is that is that substantial Niagara? Um STN, right. I think that's the subthalamic nucleus. Oh. Right, I think you're right because that's that's what the target of D. What's DBS? Because that's the target of DBS. I know that, but what's DBS stand for? Uh, give me a second. Well, what have I what have I told you is the is the most important discovery of my oh, life? Oh, deep I've brain been. stimulation. Okay, that's the second most important. So, in case anyone was wondering if I was ranking them, but CRISPR, most important thing of my lifetime. Okay, which includes your lifetime, All right? Most important discovery, and, and then deep brain stimulations up there. It's got to be like two or three. Deep brain stimulation. They stick a probe in your brain permanently, and they they send you electrical signals whenever whenever you need it. Uh, it it is being used for originally Parkinson's disease, and it works. It is miraculous to see it used in real life. Um, if you know anybody with Parkinson's and they have this. Uh, and kindly ask them from a scientific and medical standpoint if you if they would allow you to watch watch them use it it's amazing um essentially they take this like they take this remote looking thing and they put it and it's like a looks like a battery and they put it on this point on their chest where they've buried an electrode and they hit the button and when they hit the button it sends a deep pulse into their brain that stops the tremor and then they're almost perfect. It's, it is like, it gives me goosebumps. When I saw it in medical school, it was, it was amazing. Um, but they're using it for all sorts of things. Now they're using it for obsessive compulsive disorder, depression, um, bipolar disorder. It works really well in, uh, pretty much a lot. No, any, they're, they're trying it on pretty much everything now. Um, the problem with it is that, one of the negatives, and it's really a very minor negative, is is what Johan just said. If you look over on the right of this figure, there is a significant impact on the PDRP. Do we do we go over what PDRP is? I didn't know what PDRP was. I had to look it up. Uh, Parkinson's disease related commutative pattern. Yeah, which happens. Kind of by itself, right? That was our understanding of it. Yeah, seems seems to happen in sham surgeries anyway. Yeah. So yeah, it's a weird placebo effect, but it's a good placebo effect. It actually, usually helps. But when you do brain deep brain simulation, they don't get that. Yeah. Okay. What are the uh, what are your conclusions? So conclusions and implications. There were increased linkages between basal ganglia in cortical, premotor, and motor regions as a result of using gene therapy as an alternate form of treatment for Parkinson's disease patients. The gene therapy used in the study is a new treatment towards curing neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson's. And why are connections more beneficial to a human? As the leading question. Yeah. Well, I also had an issue with the with curing, right? I didn't like the use of the word curing, but you had you thought that it really was a step in that direction. Yeah. Right. But is it going to stop neurodegeneration? It won't because there's still gonna be different neurons that are gonna be degenerating. But there's also forming new connections between Regions that didn't have the connections before the gene therapy. Okay, so then then we then that goes to the to the question at hand: why why are connections more beneficial to a human? Are they? I mean, just in general, having stop a, sharing your screen because I want to see okay. everybody's face. 
this is important because this is this is a really interesting topic when i talk to kids when i do like guest lectures places the teenagers want to talk about three subjects you okay you okay don't you have a seizure i don't have time we're busy um <clears throat> they talk about three subjects they want to talk about drugs they want to talk about sex and they and not rock and roll they want to talk about what it is to be an adult that tends those tend to be the subjects they like talking about so do more connections mean gooder more more connections gooder is that true here this is a discussion people so and vanya you raised your hand so you go ahead and um before i was just i was gonna ask if this like could help als at all or is like als too degenerative for this What do you think, Marco? I think it can if it has, like, the same effect. Like, you know, like, I don't know what, how ALS works, but if it attacks the certain region that is being affected in the brain, then I believe it could work for it as well. Uh, we don't, we're not super sure about how ALS, how ALS starts, but it's amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and it usually gets you get demyelination and degeneration of motor neurons but the other stuff is perfectly fine are you having a seizure oh okay stop it uh, <clears throat> so but I, yeah i don't see why it wouldn't right if I, we if you isolate what what exactly is causing als lou gehrig's disease can't you attack it with something like this I just think it would be temporary. Like it wouldn't like keep working. Yeah. That's a good, that's actually also a good criticism of this paper, right? Because it only goes out to 12 months and even in figure. Yeah. Figure one B it has records for sham surgery. Uh, sorry. For natural progression after sham surgery that goes out 48 months but not data on it for for this treatment so is it as soon as the what are they called what did you call them dopa something uh cells as soon as they die you can't actually do this on them anymore like as soon as they die fully yeah well actually if you notice Again, I'm going to have to... Marco, did they actually inject this into substantia nigra, which are the things dying, or just the downstream targets, which is the striatum? I thought it was into the substantia nigra, right? Like you okay. injected the AAV2, GAD. Into like the that. substantia nigra? Or the, I don't subthalamic, know. Th the subthalamic nucleus, I think. No, that's something else. The subthalamic nucleus is actually a different nucleus. Oh, okay. Um, that's right. That's where they. In that, yeah. No, I don't think they. I don't think they injected it into the cells that were dying. And it's usually those. Those cells are really in the substantia nigra in the black substance. They are actually really, really um, sensitive for some reason. They tend to die really easily compared to other neurons. Um, and and you. Like if any of you were tell if any of you came in and told me, hey, I was welding over the weekend and I was wondering if you've ever tried that, and I'd be like, no, and you should stop because what there is an extremely high prevalence of Parkinson's disease in welders or people who grow up near paper mills or chemical factories or anything. There is an environmental influence on those cells. They're very sensitive. Okay. They're like the they're like the millennials of your neurons. They're very sensitive. They like avocado toast, you know. Um, whereas you guys now, having lived through COVID, are the robust ones. You're more like the forebrain. Uh, so are connections, more connections, more beneficial? Are they, are they more gooder? Are you asking this in the brain or just in general? In, in general of people, Johan. I say yes, because the more people you uh, connect with, um, the more opportunities, like, 
like you have in the future like for example like college like you were just talking about that like if you get to know like different types of people different majors you know okay. maybe like you guys could uh, help each other out in the future is it possible to have too many though can't having too many connections socially mean that you can't make any deep, meaningful connections? Not, not yeah. always. Not always. No, not it's, always. But is it possible? Yes, it's possible. Yeah. All right. So let's change the question of what Marco just said. What about in the brain specifically? Are more connections more gooder? Not always. Like, there's a cutoff point where they might not know how to actually use the connections to fulfill their purpose. Is there a model of more connections versus fewer connections that we can actually look at? Vanya. Okay, I, don't, I, I just had a thought this might be like completely wrong. But didn't you say something about... Okay, I was... I'm just remembering something from... Uh, honors bio last year didn't you say something about like like too many connections makes you autistic or something like that i heard i remember you saying that i don't know Some, if it's right somebody yeah. somebody actually listened to me in class <laughs> <laughs> a tear comes to my eye yeah if more connections are more gooder then people with autism should be the the most good gooderest of all of us because they end up having lots and lots and lots of connections Right. Uh, so, yeah. Is that necessarily a good thing? What about what about among humans that are that develop uh, typically normally? Do we have a good model for that? Uh, Nolan should know this, having taken my took, taken neuro. Uh, go ahead. Funny. I was just I was just gonna say like when you're going through puberty. My God, you listen to me. Where how come you other people don't listen to me? <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, what happens in puberty? Um, you like <laughs> you, sorry, it was just funny. Um, you get like too many connections and then like so say if you were to ask me a simple question, I would overthink it so much to the point where it would take me longer to get to the answer. So I would be like, if I was an adult and I already went through puberty, you'd be like, um, like, I don't know, like, what's your name? And mm -hmm. like, and a, a kid like going through puberty would be like, well, do you want my nickname or do you want my last name or do you want my something mm -hmm. like that? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I just remember that. Yeah. Yeah. And then you won't be able to like focus on one thing if you like, if you have too many and then you, I don't know. Maybe I'm going off the track here, but no, you're not. You're dead on, dead on track. Are more connections more good or not always? Yeah. Right. And that's a great example in a normally developing brain of why. Okay. Babies and children have about 2,500 synapses per neuron. Adults like me have about 2,500 synapses per neuron. But you guys have like 10,000 four times as many, which means that you have this information randomly going out to other things that it shouldn't go, that, it, that don't do any good, right? Like who cares if I'm asking your, I just want to be able to call you something. Give, just give me a name. I don't care. Why does it matter if it's your last name, your nickname, your, your confirmation name, your, your given name, the, your Nick, your other like version of who cares? Just give me something to call you. Um, and, and so that, that inability to make decisions leads to, in some cases, very bad decisions in teenagers. Another reason why things like alcohol are really bad for teenagers, because that also inhibits your really poor ability to make decisions even more. Okay. So if you were wondering, like, why is alcohol illegal for kids under 21? Well, that's a long conversation, but but one of the reasons is is that you're already making poor decisions. You know, this is, that would not help you at all. Um, so 
more more connections, more gooder. Me, Lila. So would a child respond better to alcohol than a teenager? The thing is, the thing is that that teenage brain is a really important step in rewiring the brain so that it's useful, so that it actually gets to, it makes the connections that are going to be used. Hebb's postulate uh, is f neurons that fire together, wire together. So if they're firing together, you're going to, you're going to be able to, to use that synaptic pathway, that, that connection quickly kids kids have their brains have kind of just made 2500 synapses to random things they're very promiscuous they go and they make connections to things that aren't going to help at all which is why they're actually so beautifully imaginary everything's everything their imaginations run wild because they have connections they they make connections in their brain that adults have eliminated unless you have ADHD then a lot of those aren't eliminated and you tend to be more curious and more um, creative than those who don't have ADHD as adults. Uh, so just because they have fewer connections doesn't mean that they're really effective because it's by adulthood that you have more effective, useful connections. But on the flip side, you're also less creative. You're also not going to necessarily be able to make the multiple connections that a teenage brain might. Like there's a, there, there's another reason why college happens when it does, right? You, high school and college, high school, you're still learning some stuff, but in college, you actually get to start applying it and using that creative reconnecting part of your brain before it gets set in stone. And, and college kids come out with some really good scholarship, really good ideas. Think again, Facebook, right? Facebook was invented by a college kid. The Microsoft uh, Gates left Harvard to pursue the Microsoft thing, you know, he, he was still a kid. A lot of that stuff happens when you're, when you're young. So long as you don't have jerks telling you to be rigid, you know, like, like stop thinking about those other things, stop doing art, stop being creative. You know, you got to get a job. Th that's the time. Like when people are like, I don't know what my major is going to be. And they're upset. I'm like, why are you upset? Like you, you need to know what your major is by like end of sophomore year. Don't worry about it before then you need to go explore the world. That's the point of college. So you can make connections that are meaningful, not just a huge network. That's the problem with social media is that those are not meaningful connections. You don't know who clicked on your video a million times. It's not like your friends anymore, right? So Marco, should this have been published in science translational medicine? I mean, it's a step in the right direction, so. I think it was valid for this journal. Yeah, I think so too. I think it's pretty good. Um, anybody want to disagree? Science translational medicine is so science and nature, e life and cell, those are like the big four, right? The sexy four. And each of them has not, not e life, but the other three have like their own little kind of ch child journals that are, that are subspecialties. Like cell has current biology. And a bunch of other ones. Uh, science has science, then science translational medicine, science letters has a, and then nature has na a ton. Nature has a ton. Nature neuroscience, nature reviews neuroscience, nature medicine, nature, eh, tons and tons. They're all really, really good journals, really highly regarded journals. So this is, this has a very high impact factor. And uh, I thought it was okay. Yeah. Um, some of you seemed to, to be surprised that this was at eight o'clock. So let's do logistics. Oh, let, let, good job, Marco. Yay. We got to come up with a better way to do this since it's always silent. Yeah. Johan had the sense to turn off, turn on his mic. All right. Uh, uh, any last questions, comments, concerns, criticisms, critiques? No? Okay. Thank you all. Hopefully that was, hopefully it was interesting. See you later. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.
Uh, Lila, what's up? Um, sorry, this is a random question. What would happen if you gave a child alcohol then? If it, if it, yeah. So would... that's a really interesting question. Um, so it's really, 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 actually health health wise bad for kids to have it because they have. I have a gigantic fly in here. It's huge. Um, take care of that first. It, no, it's uh, I, I'm not gonna be able to catch it. The, I'm in my room with all my camera equipment. It's all sensitive equipment. I can't go swinging things at it. Um, it's so so you'll understand it better if you take neuro, which would be your senior. Yeah, senior year you you'd have neuro. Um, in in adults, we produce a protein that pumps chloride out of the cell. Kids don't. So kids, babies, babies and toddlers and young children don't produce that protein yet. That gene is not on. And so there is more chloride in the cell than there is out. So if you were to open a chloride channel in an adult, if I open a chloride channel by using something like alcohol, Chloride comes in and depresses my nervous system. It inhibits the neurons. Okay. If you do the same thing to a baby, the chloride actually goes out of the cell, depolarizing the cell, making it have seizures. It activates the baby instead of depressing its nervous system. It activates the nervous system. And what usually happens if a baby goes and chugs a vodka or something like that, they will have seizures. Now you got to be a terrible parent to be putting vodka in the baby bottle, but that's actually what happens. It's and it's really bad for brain. The wiring we were just talking about making networks requires activity. So if you are overactive or underactive, you're going to screw up the way the the brain is wired. So another reason why you shouldn't be having uh, a an altering, altering substance like alcohol when you are a teenager because you're going through re rewiring and you want the rewiring to work correctly. But if you're drinking regularly as a teenager, and I know people who've done that, um, it does not allow your brain to form those co meaningful connections the way it would have had you not been drinking. So alcohol is not a good thing for it's really not. It's really not good for anybody. Period. It's really not good for anybody. Period. the The only good thing about alcohol is that it it thins your blood, which has been shown to decrease heart disease and stroke, and Alzheimer's. But that's it. You can get blood thinners from an aspirin. You don't need to drink. Make sense? Yeah. Also, wait. So do drugs kind of just do a similar thing to a baby and just like give it a seizure or do they have different responses depending on what you give it or is it just like everything kills it no no different different responses based on what you do like if kins has i was you know i was worried about her because she was acting weird if she had a seizure she's an adult she's she's 11 years old i'd be I, you'd see me run out of the room to the fridge i'd go and grab a a syringe of valium i'd shove it up her butt and squeeze and it's a rectal gel it has it's it has this stuff called valium in it valium works exactly like alcohol does it does exactly the same thing and so what that would do is it would get absorbed into her bloodstream and it would shut down the seizure like right away like it's quick it's it's within within 30 seconds to a minute if i do the same thing to a baby right if a baby's having a seizure the only thing you can do you can't give it that drug. If you give it that drug, the seizure will get worse because whatever's happening is going to be the opposite of an adult. Um, what you, the only thing you can do is, is, is throw it into a, into an ice bath, a baby, you throw it into an ice bath, decrease its body temperature significantly. That actually causes something called the diving reflex and shuts the brain down. Think about it. It would also happen to you. I could do the same thing to you. When when people have really, really bad fevers, they'll they'll have seizures. So to avoid getting to that point, they will have to take an ice bath. Very comfortable. Great. 
It's awful. If you've ever, if you've ever had an ice bath, it's, it is the worst thing ever. It's terrible. It's like, you might as well light me on fire. It's the worst. Um, but yeah, no babies, each drug has a different target, which is why I was excited about talking about cocaine. I thought we were going to talk about cocaine and cause, because the understanding how cocaine works is a really useful model for understanding how neurons behave in general and how, how they actually grow and form and develop and all that stuff. So, um, like I was saying that, Oh, to you, I was saying to your, your, your shadow, right? I've never seen cocaine except in a vial that we gave to some rats. I didn't, you know, I've never seen like the powder form, but I talk, people are always like how much cocaine have I? I've never even seen it, you know, but it's a, it's a really interesting. It was amazing how much reading I did that I was made to read in graduate school where they're like, here's a paper. You need to read these 10 papers tonight. And they were all, all about cocaine. I yeah. mean, part of it was the, the one of the world's leading experts was my teacher. And so he was giving us all his papers, but what God, we have to bring in like a local drug dealer as our expert to like, tell us how <laughs> cocaine works. I don't know. You probably even know like one or two, right? No, no, I don't. I don't know. I don't know anybody who's, I don't think I know anybody who's even tried cocaine. Cocaine was a really 80s drug, like 80s. And and it was also, it was used by um, like law students and business people to keep them awake while they were doing deals or studying for, you know, law, like Yale. People at Yale used it all the time as a study aid. So it was like rich white people. And, and then there was crack, which was used by lower socioeconomic class, yet and it was weaker than cocaine but if you had crack you were you went to jail for like 10 times longer amazing well, yeah we'll talk about that in neuro it makes the i don't want to give i don't want to talk about everything so anyway i'm going to i'm going i'm going to do my thing so all right thank Have a good you night. All right, see you bye. later